So I'm going to welcome everybody. Uh, you've been watching us as we've been kind of getting ready for today's uh, pizza talk session. And today we have John Gudekatz from Athens, Ohio, Avalanche Pizza, but well known beyond that as a uh, world champion pizza maker, as uh, as a contributor to uh, pizza, is a Pizza Today magazine. Um, you're everywhere. You're uh, you're uh, what I say ubiquitous because you sh uh, at the Pizza Expos, you're a host, you're a MC. Your competitor, you're everything, and also extremely creative. And I love your site. Uh, what is it? The Pizza Goon is your is your blog. And uh, yeah. uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about how that came about? And maybe um, you know, the, for those people who don't know you, because a lot of our viewers are not people who get to go to Pizza Expo. Tell um, tell us a little bit about your journey, you know, into the pizza world and how you became the Pizza Goon. <laughs> well, thank you. Flattery will get you everywhere, Peter. I, I'm, I'm really honored to be on, on your show. I, I'm, I've read all your books, and I continue to read them. That's the, well, thank you. Uh, we're let's, see, you let's see what Peter did. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to do that. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I started out actually in the, the fine dining area. I, actually, I was a dishwasher in an Italian place at 14 years old. And uh, I, I really, uh, I keep going back to that. It was Bimbo's Italian uh, uh, restaurant. There's three brothers. They're from Lecce. And um, uh, Bimbo was my hero. Tall guy, slick back hair. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the head dishwasher was an old guy who smoked a cigar. It, no air conditioning, 104 degrees. And I had my three compartment sink and I would do dishes in it. And it amazed me because it looked like lobster bisque, but these dishes would come out sparkling. And you know, because I'd never changed the water. But uh, the head dishwasher's name was Mouse, and he called me Weasel. He had a name for everybody. And it was, a, it was a, quite a trip. Anyway, uh, Bimbo re really, you know, he, he, was the, he was stern and strict. And, but I, he, he used to, I mean, one thing in particular, he used to bring the tomatoes over to the sink. He made me clean the sink out, he'd come with a colander, and he would take, just take his time, almost meditatively, just, he'd say, eshe, eshe, eshe. And I'm like, what does eshe mean? So he means get the hell out of the way, you know? So I would pull over the can and he would, he would go through each can, each tomato, and he would say, you never let anyone see your seeds in your sauce. Never let anyone see seeds in your sauce. And, and that just, it really stuck with me, you know? And, and always use the, the best ingredients, et cetera. But, so uh, after that, I just, uh, I've been in restaurants my whole life, hamburgers, ice cream places, and. And then I uh, gravitated, I went to the, into the Navy for five years and we flew off the coast of uh, Soviet Union, North Korea, China uh, as an, a cryptologist. And um, then I came back into a, a country club and they, they automatically made me sommelier. And I was like, what's a, what's a sommelier? <laughs> and they just showed me the wine cellar, this dank, dark wine cellar. All the, all the labels were off the bottles. I didn't know what the hell it was. So, uh, it's like uh, your, I, your destiny had been stamped on you at the age of 14, which seems to be a critical age for so many people that we're talking to. 14 was a very crucial age, I think, for kind of fore foreshadowing what was to come. Yeah, and that's, that's, I think that that age bracket, and when I bake pizzas with kids, it's that age bracket where they start to, they get that creativity that I can make something. People aren't telling me anything. I did this, and it's really important. Uh, but anyway, after that, I, I went to Chicago, and I was at Liceo Blue for a, a while, and I started out as a, a waiter and gravitated to a manager, and I, we had uh, you know Paul Buku there, Elton John. In fact, I couldn't even watch Elton's movie because I'm like, no, no, you were here. <laughs> but... Uh, he, he was, uh, and Gregory Zipchek, who's now the, the president of CIA, he was a, a nice guy, except he called me John Dory all the time. John Dory. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, a, a, after that. You want to call me a fish. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> but so, how did that uh, like your food? Oh, he, he hated the chef. He called him the frog. He kept sending back his lamb chops. In fact, we, 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 I couldn't tell the chef anymore. He was the, uh, Do Chef Dominique 14, I think his name was. And he came out, he, he had his knife ready and because Elton kept, he had this, this uh, Robin Hood hat on with this hugest feather. <laughs> and we had to move the tables away from him. And he, he, it was after a concert and he kept calling him that stupid frog in the kitchen. <laughs> that, and I, 
So well, finally, well, Brits and the French have kind of a thing, you know? <laughs> yes, I think so. But uh, he tipped me $600, so that was fine, you know? And hey. uh, they He's allowed. your guy. <laughs> He's my man. <laughs> I can be bought, yes. I love it. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that was a lot of fun. It was, it was really neat because that's when I just started table side. And, you know, it's just, uh, you know, I had a, a guy named Gaetano Fugazzato, Sicilian, looked like Richard Gere. And he taught me how to do everything. He said, you know, it, his, his motto was, a no dog barks at a rich man. And to this day, there are so many facets of that yeah. saying. Like a rich man wouldn't be, he'd be driving down, he wouldn't be walking down the road, you know, stuff like that. But his premise was, if you're going to do something in front of someone, make it look good, make it look like you meant to. Even if you're going to steal from someone, look them in the eye while you're picking their pocket, you know. And, uh, and this guy, he'd sit there and he'd do a shot of Louis Thirteenth with a packed house of, and I was his front waiter and I'm just like, Gaetano, come on, we got to, you know, I got to do this mushroom thing over at the table over here. And he's like, don't. And uh, <laughs> so that was a lot of fun. And then uh, I gravitated to uh, Entree New Restaurant, which is at the Fairmont Hotels, and Richard Swig. I don't know if you remember him. Uh, just John beautiful. Richard, but... his, his whole thing was keeping the guests in the hotel. So he had these outlets. Uh, they ha I remember one of them was crazy. We went to, in this uh, San Francisco, the Tonga Room. And I thought, oh, this is going to be so cheesy. But it was that... a good cheese, man. <laughs> You were at the Fairmont in San Francisco, John. You were in the one in San Francisco, the Fairmont. Yeah, we yeah, visited that there. Time. I was the one in Chicago. Oh, so. okay. But yeah, they had a big pool in the middle, and every uh, quarter, half an hour, the band would come out on a <laughs> on a raft, and it would rain, and you're under these Polynesian little huts eating, <laughs> and it was just hilarious. It was so, and all these old people were doing the snake dance, dun 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 dun. You know, it just brought you back to the 30s or 40s, but. The, and those yeah. are the days that, that uh, Trader Vic's was one of the big, yes. uh, you know, Polynesian kind of restaurants, too. I remember that, yeah, with the big drinks with the, you know, pineapple. So you really, a lot of your culinary roots are in the Chicago area before, before you moved yes. into Ohio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a lot of table side service, uh, just from flambés to smoked salmon and uh, Caesar salads. <laughs> I'd get weeded with, you know, I have to do 20 Caesar salads at three different tables and they'd bring me out all the lettuce in a, in a giant tablecloth. <laughs> just, you know, just uh, try and try and make my way through that. But, uh, and then I went to, uh, I well, moved to- I have to have your Caesar salad one of these days because that's still my favorite food of all time is Caesar salad made table oh, side. Yes. I, I can oh. never get enough of it when it's done well. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And in fact, I still train guys here. You know, they cut off the stems. I'm like, do you know there's restaurants that only serve the stems of romaine? You know that, right? <laughs> and well, wow, why would they do that? You know. <laughs> um, but then so you've uh, all these little nuggets that you've picked up over the years. You know, uh, it's no seeds in the sauce. You know, uh, <laughs> uh, look, look them in the eye. Whatever the other yeah. all those little romaine uh, stems and. and and then uh, save, the, save the stems. <laughs> yeah. So uh, then I moved uh, to another restaurant they had in the same hotel, a really, really high volume La Primavera. And that's where I met uh, my friend, best friend, Giovanni De Negris. And he's in uh, Chicago now, Trattoria Trullo. And a uh, wonderful guy. And you know, he, uh, it, was, it was just beautiful time. It was really, really intense, though. We have five, 600 covers a night. And the Bulls were winning at that time too. So we would get the losing teams. We would host the loot. Well, we would host the oh, team well, that was playing the Bulls. Yeah. And they would come in late at night and they would just be ticked off. And <laughs> but I, I tried to take care of them as best I could. And one of the best celebs I've ever waited or brought into my restaurant and my staff waiting on is Sha Shaquille O'Neal. He was the oh, most yeah. gracious guy. He would eat five, he would eat four to five bowls of fettuccine Alfredo and just sit there and he would sign every autograph, people, all the whole restaurant. And then he'd buy the restaurant. He'd like, John, I'll take care of the, all of the desserts. Oh and just, I'm like, no, I've got five tables waiting in the bar. No. <laughs> well, but, uh, no wonder everybody loves Shaq. I mean, yeah. he's, you know, he is the big teddy bear of a guy. And yeah. uh, really you're lucky that you got to meet him while he was still yeah. playing. That's it. 
But uh, yeah, I was like, uh, my, we were watching Goodfellas once and that, that scene in Goodfellas where they, they bring in a table and put it in front, that's, that's me. My wife goes, that's you! That was because she, uh, <laughs> she was a singing, we had singing waiters and waitresses there, real opera singers. So really? that's where I met my wife. Yeah, I hired, I hired my wife. <laughs> Wow. I, was just, I was just a scumbag. I was asked. I very was interviewed. I'm like, I'm like doing my tuxedo. I'm like, so, uh, so you're an opera singer, and she's like, yes. Wow. And I'm like, so to get to work, is there a, like a you have a car or a significant other with a car? Or? <laughs> this like, does sound like a scene out of the Goodfellas. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the piano was the big thing, the big draw in the middle of the room, and I would. Uh, bring my bussers out, five of them, and I would roll an eight top that, you know, if you got duped really well, the guy knows you, uh, uh, doctor or whatever, and you roll it up. I would have them sing on the other side of the room. So everyone's like this, doing some beautiful, you know, uh, just gorgeous singing. And I would come through the back and set this table up and people would go back to eating after the song. And they're like, that, was that table there? <laughs> Just like on Goodfellas, where you Magic. go in front. Yes. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> but um, so that's cool. So, but this is quite a, quite a uh, sort of a precursor to your leap into the world of pizza. So, how did that all happen? Yes. Well, actually, I, after that, I went to the uh, uh, the Oak Room. Uh, uh, Open the Oak Room. Uh, we uh, Copley Plaza Hotel was changing hands a fair amount, so I went there. And I met uh, Marcella Hazen and uh, Julia Child. They helped us open it. They were with Sally Jackson, and uh, she's a PR rep, uh, best friends. And I got to meet with them, cook with them. That, that was really, really inspiring. But uh, um, then I went to, uh, after that, I went to uh, Washington, D.C., to an 800-room hotel on the shore as director of restaurants and, and uh, food and beverage director. And that was under a renovation. It was then that I started realizing I was working so much and you know you were only as good as the last gm that you had other gms would bring in their own crews you're out and uh uh the the pay was good but it wasn't worth 14 to 17 hour days and i remember one guy this guy had come in the restaurant and i saw him and i seated him for breakfast i seated him for lunch and then he came in at 2 p.m and he had scones and, and tea and then I realized I haven't even eaten yet. This guy's eaten three times. And I said, something's, something's got to gotta go. So, you know, uh, you know, a friend of mine uh, who's a chef, uh, had been a chef in fine dining and then moved into sort of a, the uh, more uh, everyday casual type food. And I said, well, how did you make that decision to move out of fine dining? And he said, I was told by one of my mentors that if you feed the elite, you eat with the masses. But if you feed the masses, you eat with the elite. And, and that, <laughs> was, that was what drove me. Yeah, I love I that. It stuck with me. Like one of your so nuggets. You know? Yes. It's like, yeah, you see the chef in the corner eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And just like, what, what's up with that chef? Uh, yeah. Just let me alone. Yeah. Uh, so, but uh, then I, uh, my mom lived here in Athens. And she had a little thing that uh, Little Caesars was uh, going out of business. And so I came. We went through all the rigmarole and we decided and my all my friends said don't do it don't do it and i said no i don't let i want to get into the pizza thing and uh so um got some great recipes from my friend giovanni and some other chef friends that i knew and uh, we just started in the year 2000 in, in this small town and we got a loan with no money down and so but uh it's it's been a, a it's great ride. That's, that's twenty years ago. That's a whole generation. You had a, a a generation in fine dining, and now since then, an entire generation now in the uh, in feeding the feeding feeding the masses and eating yes. with the elite. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. So well, it's, today, I'm even getting guys. Explains, no, I'm Go sorry. Ahead. That explains a lot. When when I look at your your website and your your uh, blog and everything, I see so much creativity and so much drawing from sort of culinary heritage, not just, you know, not just the pizza community heritage, but, but you know, into other roots. And, that, and this background helps me to understand where a lot of that, where you're connecting the dots between those worlds and bringing yeah. a lot of really interesting uh, culinary history, culinary uh, technique, you know, into yeah. the realm of pizza, which is a real gift 
to the pizza community, especially those folks who are reading magazines like Pizza Today and seeing your creativity on display. Oh, so I really Thanks a lot. thank you for that and appreciate that. Yeah. I, appreciate I mean, I really that. want to talk with you uh, as we, because as, we're kind of coming to the end of this first episode, but as we get into the second episode, I'd love to see like maybe a little something that you've created, but talk some about some of the, the things you're working with, like Kernza, for instance, the this uh, wheat related grain that yeah. uh, is coming back, starting to come back. And I think that you're you know, having a hand in that. And some of the other really cool things that you've made both at Avalanche Pizza and, and I'm not sure how much of what I read is showing up on the menu at the restaurant and how much is just stuff you're doing <laughs> for fun. But I'd love to hear more about it. I see you at the Pizza and Pasta show in, in Atlantic City doing pasta demos. So, you know, you've not obviously not only doing pizza. Do you do pasta at the restaurant? Nope. No, we don't do It's too busy to pour it. But we do do cater a lot of catering with pastas and homemade pastas and stuff. And clearly, pasta you know, courses it's, it's clearly and there's stuff. Some, some passion oh. and love in that in that sector for you as well. Yeah. So well, before we, what I'm before starting we to do, segment, oh, if, you could, if you could bring all of our, you know, of our viewers just up to date, then when you made the leap over uh, and you about 20 years ago, that's when you opened your first place. Is that now Avalanche or was that something before that? That was Avalanche. I was going to name it Plague Pizza. I wanted to have these like everyone in black robes and. You answer the phone and you say, uh, can I have a Grim, Grim Reaperoni, please? And, and stuff like that. And uh, that would have been what my wife said. No, I want to put rats in the window, you know, like uh, like rubber rats. And that, that wouldn't have gone over well. Uh, now you could even have people wearing those masks with the long okay. noses on them on the show. And, uh, That's it. On CNN, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the, the medical masks, That's you know, of the yes. 17th century, the last plague. That's so, right. Uh, you, were, you were 20 years ahead of yourself on that idea. <laughs> right. Well, we were into it uh, from 2000, and about 2004, we started uh, going uh, with uh, PMQ to uh, compete, okay? And that's when I first met Tony Gimignani, and he was uh, doing the acrobatics then, um, and the Big Dave Ostrander, God rest his soul, the greatest guy in the world. Yeah. I'll tell you what, that, that gentleman was, uh, you know, Joe Carlucci, Bruno De Fabio, uh, all these guys. So we competed for a while. We won, actually, Bryn, my general manager at the time, Bryn Humphreys. Uh, I guess she's now a producer at Second City in Chicago. Uh, really? She won. I took a Godzilla. Uh, we did our Godzilla pizza. So we did a workup on it. We did rings of the spinach and then a feta. And then in the middle had some sun-dried tomatoes. Beautiful pizza. So Bryn uh, got dressed up in <laughs> This is when you, uh, the, the world pizza, this is when you did a show. Like, Sean Browser was there, and he got dressed up as uh, 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 Rocky. And uh, he's like, no, I'm Apollo Creed. I'm like, ah, you more, look more like Rocky. So they would play <laughs> the Rocky theme song, and the crowd went crazy, and he presented yeah. his pizza. So when we got up there, we, I had a Godzilla, this three-by-three-foot Godzilla head, and a Godzilla costume, like, and with the eyes would... And we played Blue Oyster Cult, go, go, Godzilla. And uh, Bryn presented her pizza. She was totally hungover. She looked, she looked green with green sequins. And, and uh, so, so we- that was, your, that, was your, that was your entrance music, was the, was the Godzilla. <laughs> That's right. And uh, it was so much fun. And uh, she won. So uh, we won that year. And then I did, it kept competing in, in uh, Italy almost every year. Uh, and, and it got, uh, some it changed. I went to the World Pizza Champions, and it ended up being just me, Bruno De Fabio, and Tony. And it was that was really uh, really fun. Uh, Justin Wadstein, oh my gosh, I, I, I gotta say this: Justin is like the best of the best pizza people I've ever met in my life. You know, he called me back. It, it, it was he was doing acrobatics, and I'd seen him on a. I'd seen him do a chair over his head just and freak people out. And he's like, John, out back in the alley. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and he had this board and he was nailing this uh, beautiful 400 thread count uh, towel to it. And he had a diesel fuel. And I'm like, what the, what are you doing, Justin? He's like, this is my act. I'm going to make an inverted tornado. <laughs> and I'm like, you're going to burn the place down. And so we, I helped him and, and me and Joe Carlucci and we lit it up and he, this, I mean, it was a huge board too. It was about two and a half by two and a half. And he just kept going and Heinz Beck, the chef was right there with the, and the, the fire department was there too, the fire chief. And sure enough, that thing turned into an inverted 
a tornado of fire. And I, wow. I'll never forget. Wow. I wish we had video of that. Um, oh my God! Were you also competing in the in the uh, acrobatic side, or were you doing more of the? No, I was pizza? too old. Too old. Just did uh, the pizzas. I did all of the the things in 2006. I think I got the highest yeah. score in uh, uh, Napolitana. And it, even though I had a hole in my pizza, but you know what? The mozzarella saved me. It just at the la I put it on the plate. And I'm like, I hole. And then the mozzarella just went right over the hole. And I'm like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> right. Because it was hey, beautiful. Wait, where, is, where is Justin these days? Is he still is he still in the game? Yes, he's he's got a really great place out in California and he's he's making pizza some beautiful pies now. And well, yes. when we come back in our next in our next episode, because uh, we're going to continue this conversation with John Gudekanst in the next episode of Pizza Talk, I want to find out a little bit more about sort of first the the origin of the name Avalanche Pizza for you guys, which I'm sure there's a little story there, uh, and talk a little bit about some of the forward thinking things that you're that you're doing, the things you're thinking about in terms of the future of pizza, and take a look at maybe something that you've made as well. So thank you all for being with us on part one of John Gudekens. Join us again on our next episode, and we're going to continue the conversation. We'll see you then. Thanks, John. We're just continuing our conversation, having a lot of fun. John is in Athens, Ohio at Avalanche Pizza, but also uh, we're recounting some of the days on the World Pizza Champions team uh, when you guys competed against, the, and really, like you were the, uh, the outsiders coming in, and uh, I'm sure the <laughs> Italians didn't appreciate the sort of swagger that you guys, America, the Americans, brought with them, but you did we pretty well. You uh, you won some championships and yeah, uh, really helped launch, I think, here in America, uh, this booming interest in not oh, just yeah. the the sort of the theatrical side of pizza, but also the quality of pizza oh. just started expanding. And I think we brought back to, and tell me if I'm wrong, because you've been over there more than me, the Americans brought over to them the sense that almost anything's possible on top of a pizza and uh, and expanded their thinking about that. Would, would you say that that kind of oh, yeah. a little reciprocation oh, there? Totally, totally. In fact, uh, I've got a, a I got a story about Bruno and Tony and I who and Justin, and uh, it won the best food writing 2012. And it's about me. I thought we'd go over there and I'd be like, oh yeah, and then I'll 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 go to the store and buy some truffles. And but it became this like mafia type drug deal in the mountains that turned into <laughs> at, at the same time Bruno was was doing the fastest I mean I've never seen anyone faster than him and he's won so many times and doing the fastest pizza and uh it just all melded together Tony Justin saying you know are you sure you want to go in there I don't know Those, yeah right. <laughs> we walked into this back of this place and everyone just stopped it was just like oh my gosh but uh I finally got the truffles, the Bianchetto truffles uh, from uh, that area. And uh, I don't think I won. Uh, one of the judges, I, he came up to me. I, I paired I paired it with scallops, diver scallops, I believe. Oh, yeah. And he came up to me and he goes, oh, Josef, he's just German. Josef on with it. This scallop on a pizza, seafood, no. Should, I'm like, well, so you didn't score me high then, right? I'm like, you. You piece of crap. You're wearing an ascot, okay? <laughs> Who wears an ascot? You, and they're pulling me off of them. I'm just like, you're like Rock Hudson, man, but it's only like 40 years too late. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but the whole trip goes I think The judges down. always were looking for a way to bust Americans' chops back oh, then. You know, if they could bust you on anything, they would. Uh, Tony told us some stories about, you know, he told, uh, I don't even think we got it on the tape interview with him, but when, when he told me what in time where they, you know, when he was competing for that margarita, uh, championship and one of the judges told him that the box he was using was all wrong that he was, that he was mixing in something that wasn't legal and Tony said no it is and he actually corrected the judge who was about to disqualify him when another oh. judge came and basically told the first judge to step back because he's Tony's right and you're wrong so you know it, it's kind of like like this oh, yeah. but, oh, but, but, but when you started Avalanche uh, how did you even get the the name Avalanche where did that come from I wanted to do uh, something different uh, as usual, but I wanted to have a ton of toppings. Okay. So we started with 28 toppings. I think we're up to you know, 80 now. We're, I mean, Lord knows uh, kimchi. I make kimchi every week. It's one of our most popular toppings it, it paired with provolone cheese. I, I even get these, these, I don't say hillbillies, these, these rural people, like an old rural guy came in. It's like, Oh yeah, give me that. 
that Chinese cabbage on on a, just a cheese of provolone and Chinese cabbage. And I'm like, well, it's cr up, coming right up. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it is just amazing. And now uh, I started um, about 15 years ago, just going all local. And so we have local pork, local chicken, local beef now that we make our own sausage. There's no nitrates in our, our sausage. We get it in tubes. And we, it's a simple mix and people uh -huh. love it. You can just literally taste the difference. Uh, and uh, the, uh, it, it's just the vegetables all summer long we, we get are all local. So that to me, when uh, right now we're having a hard time finding cheese, actually the same cheese that we use, the quality cheeses are, are gone. I don't know what's happening with the whole system now. But, uh, uh -huh. Hopefully, hopefully that's going to correct itself soon, we hope. But yes. you, you, you have done some really unique, interesting things. Again, I don't know how much of this shows up on the menu, <laughs> but on your blog, I see some really cool things. Uh, you, you made something called a slagle. Is that what it was? Am I getting that right? A yeah, snaggle? a snaggle. Snaggle. Get your, yeah. get your, <laughs> what is a snaggle? It looks like it looks like it a was, bagel on the outside, but it's it got was. something going on inside, yes. right? <laughs> well, we we took some pizza dough, and I wanted to. So I put everything in there. I we've got uh, smoked salmon capers, red onions, cream cheese, and that's it. And I, we rolled it up into a snake, okay? And at first I did a snake, uh, but then I'm like, hey, we could make this into a giant bagel. So I put it together and let it proof, popped it in uh, some water with corn uh, cornstarch, and you know, it, it came out. And then I put everything toppings on it. So it was an everything bagel. So you with you boiled it like a bagel, though. You, you oh. treated it like a bagel, then you baked it off with, with oh, everything yes. topping. It was so it's so in a way it was, the inside almost looks like a little bit like a stromboli in a way kind of a rolled up and filled in. so it's a bagel it, yeah. stromboli uh everything bagel thing um uh, off in the oven did, so, did you actually sell those or did you oh, just yeah, make them for yeah. fun? we sell them i've got the best conditions ever for anything innovative and and it's it's our farmers market we have one of the 10 best farmers markets in the country so I go down i usually bake with joel joel fair and i um and chris sometimes we go uh, we bake from about nine o'clock at night on Friday night till about nine in the morning. And I go over with 400 some odd pieces of breads, pizzas, et cetera. Uh, and we sell out in an hour and a half. So that's, that's our creative uh, juice that runs that. Um, and it's become this kind of, I have kind of a cult following, but people will eat anything I do, uh, anything I make, cause they know I'm using the best ingredients. So yeah. we started doing, um, uh, uh, like the chicken schmaltz laminated breads and stuff. I did a, uh, oh my God, this thing was so great. I made a, a gnocchi, a giant gnocchi. And I wanted, and Joel's like, John, John, you're gonna. I'm like, no, this is great. Cause I have potato in this, this dough. It's really hydrated, nice and puffy. So I took it, I got a pot of water going together uh, with malt, uh, malt inside it. And I, I wanted to put the strips in it like a gnocchi. And then I took the, uh, when you use pans, you have to have a raised uh, uh, metal thing on your make line. You've seen those, okay? So I took that and took the dough and just went <laughs> like that, and it created the perfect gnocchi. I had the perfect uh, uh, under uh, underlayment, popped it in there, and then I baked them off. It was really cool, huge gnocchi. So how big was the was the gnocchi? It was, a, it was, it was a, still a giant yoki when it came out? Yes, it was so, giant. It was, it was like it was a, it was, airy. And it was a Godzilla yoki. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was. And because I boiled it, it, yeah. it didn't lose its form, which is, sometimes is tough to do when you're trying to make something. Like I've been trying to mimic pastas and it, it, it's a little tough. Uh, I did one here. It's a Kresh uh, Tayat, which is, uh, I don't know if you can see that. Uh, it's a pasta type that uh, David Marcelli and uh, uh, Buca, uh, restaurant Buca, I believe he works for. He does all their pastas. So this is this was on uh, what what is that uh, with the old lady pasta ladies pasta grannies? Okay, they make this, and it's usually made with leftover polenta, and it's formed into a triangle. Oh, here I've got this. So I'll show you this. So it's formed into a triangle like this. It's made with leftover polenta. You take the the middles and bring them together like that, okay? So and then you go the polenta, under. Is the polenta in the dough? Is it a dough made with polenta? Yes. No, this doesn't. But uh, the pasta usually has polenta in the dough. I couldn't. I uh -huh. 
I couldn't manipulate it that well. So, and then you bring this over and you make sure you have a lot of uh, uh, flour there. And I par bake this and this kind of puffs up like that. And then I'll bring it up and then I add the cheese to it. And I have these duck lardo meatballs that I pop on top of that. And it just pops <laughs> up just like you would get uh, from David's restaurant. Uh, also. So it's a beautiful little handheld, uh, yes. uh, mm. almost a sandwich. -y. Got in, everything. In yeah. <laughs> so, so but I, I love doing the, those things and just trying to, uh, it's mostly out of boredom, but you know, I get people saying, God, how many drugs did you do in the seventies? I mean, as soon as you tell them you can't remember, then they know that that's, you were, that's, that's right. <laughs> but, but, uh, you're also, you know, you mentioned sort of, again, moving, moving like they hold, farm to table movement, you're using local as much as possible. But what about some of these heirloom grains that you're incorporating now into your work? Yes, uh, really what, excited. What specifically are the ones that you... Well, we're getting some, a uh, local mill has red fife every now and then, that's really cool. Uh, but the biggest one that we've, we've started on uh, and is Kernza. And you can see this is, this is Kernza. Kernza is a perennial wheatgrass, okay? And it is, it, roots go, Wes Jackson at the Land Institute, he's the, the greatest guy ever, uh, his big forte is we, we are ruining our whole world with this uh, plowing, constant plowing, the dust, the, the fertilizer, everything we use. So perennials are really big. And one of the, uh, these roots go down about 10 to 15 feet. They hold nitrogen in the soil and a really tall plant. Yeah. And but we have, and it's tough because of the, uh, we've started um, making stuff with it. They've made beer with it. Uh, I went to a symposium and they were only using 20% Kernza. They're using some of it. Uh, now we do a uh, re very thin crust pizza. This is beautiful. And I don't know, you guys out there who have uh, ever done dough, and this is just with a Gruyere on here because Kernza has this cool, cool crunch. It has, more uh, protein in it, but less gluten than uh, flour. So, and it has a lot of bran in it too. So it makes it a little tough to. So it's a it's a whole grain that you're using there, the whole yes. grain kernza. And yes. is that a hundred percent kernza, the one you're holding up right no. now? No, this is fifty percent kernza and fifty percent Manitoba wheat, uh, which is all all Trumps. Uh, and I. It's, but the problem with this is is 20% hydration. <laughs> and if you've ever done 20%, tried to knead 20, you'll look like Popeye. And you do that a yeah. few times a week. And, because uh, because why? Is, it doesn't hold water? Is that the reason? Oh, it doesn't, yeah. But, you know, time is everything. So this is, uh, it's like a, almost like a really dry pasta when you get it yeah. out. So we yeah. have to use the sheeter. And we waste a lot, too, because we have to cut it into the perfect circle. But, man, at 600 degrees... That crisp, look at that, it's just, wow, just gorgeous. And, and a very that. distinctive flavor, that you, a flavor yes. that's different from wheat, yes, even it's, though it's in the wheat family. Yeah, it's got a neat uh, back end. It's almost minty like shizo. You ever have shizo uh, in Japan? Uh, I ate a lot of shizo. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a cool thing. We've, but the problem was General Mills. Okay, General Mills owns Cascadian Farms. They're one of the biggest organic uh, companies in the world. So they bought, uh, I don't know how many million acres of Kernza because they freaked out. Kernza makes the best puffed, it's puffed wheat berries. They're really they're a lot smaller than wheat, but they, the taste is so beautiful that they flipped out and they bought all the, this Kernza. So I couldn't get any on the market from the organic. They're growers. using it, they're hoarding it all for their, their own yeah. products. Is, yeah. So they're it's like using so, it in puff wheat cereals and things yeah. like that. Yeah. Well, that's so, very interesting. Because yeah. I know that Kernza is, I mean, Kernza is one of those things that's about to tip over. We, you know, yeah. you heard it here first if you haven't heard it already. And I also want to just step back once one point and give a, a, a shout out to Wes Jackson, yes. who's uh, uh, really one of the heroes of the environmental movement. I've, I've been tracking it. Wes for about 40 years since really? he first started publishing. He's been, he's been so instrumental in saving seeds and saving the environment, saving the land. Uh, so anybody who's interested in the environment, you should be looking him up. Uh, yes. and where, where do you say that he is now? At, he's uh, at the at Land Institute, Institute in Kansas. And uh, yeah, 
And I, actually, they, there's stories. He would just take uh, two six-foot tables and put them down when he would talk to farmers and put a black tablecloth. And he actually grew Kernza in a tube, actually. It kept growing. And he, then he put formaldehyde on it and washed it off. And he, he would throw the Kernza down and show these farmers that the roots, how far the roots went. And instantly they knew that yeah. this plant has roots. So it, it goes about, I've been working with OSU Worcester, uh, a professor up there, and he is an amazing guy. And he's got me the flower. So it's been fun. Well, on, on your Pizza Goon uh, blog, there's a picture of you showing the, the root of the Kernza yeah. next to or behind you standard wheat roots that only go down about you know a fraction of the, the length into the soil so that, so basically the kernza is perennial they don't have to keep reseeding it you're after it just no. replenishes itself so what's the downside there's no downside oh, except, really. that, no, it, except it doesn't make gluten it makes pro it's high protein but not gluten protein is that correct yes. mm -hmm. yeah. so it's just a matter of figuring out all the different ways you can use it and you're already starting to do that and yeah. doing a flatbread with it what are, are you using it in anything else I'm incorporating in it with breads now uh, since we we've got a whole another load. So I did a uh, I did some uh, actually I did a uh, what is it uh, uh, something head uh, Star Trek uh, head. <laughs> it was very weird. Uh, we, I added maple syrup. So this this these farmers give me all sorts of stuff that I have to use. So one farmer gave me fermented maple syrup. Klingon head. I did a Klingon head mega batard this weekend. So I, I, it was sweet and it's Kernza. And I, so I cut two holes in the end of the batard and cut this and it looks like a Klingon's forehead. So uh, it was fun, <laughs> but it was, and it was hundred percent semolina uh, underneath. So it's oh, savory that's... semolina and you've got the sweet Klingon on top. And that was fun. I, so I'm now, really why get, on? Are you are you a uh, a Star Trek fan, no. or was it just something, just an image that came to you when you did it? <laughs> I just like weird names because I love because I'm right there when people are buying it. They're they're going, what children of the corn? And it's, that was a batard that I wrapped in. It, I filled it with corn and everything, and then I wrapped it back into the the corn ca uh, the corn outside the skins and baked it. <laughs> so, but um, I've yeah. had some pretty uh weird a hobo sack i did a hobo sack pizza which is cool you just you know you, you put everything inside and then you bring up the four ends uh, and that came out of necessity uh when i do a lot of baking i'll do blobs what i call blobs i'll create the sourdough i put them on a sheet pan cover them with plastic pop them in the oven age it for two days and then i, I lay it out like a jibata on a stainless steel table and i can cut squares out of that so the squares i take each part of that tie it together it looks like a hobo sack remember the old hobos where they have to stick sure. in the sack so or sometimes uh the what do they call them uh, a bride's purse or something like that yes. too, you know? but they so they're like purses like they, so they're filled almost like uh i don't know like a little pocket pizza or a, a cow zone in a sense yes uh, absolutely well, well this is the this is the problem you're dangerous because you've got you've got a, tr a classic background in culinary you've got this sort of wild pizza experience with the pizza world team going over to Italy and, and, and getting crazy over there. And then you've got this imagination. And it, essentially what that means is, is pretty much anything you think of, you can find a way to make it happen. And now it's you're- fun and no one's stopping me. That's the problem. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> there lies the problem. Well, I'm sure that that's part of your wife's job, right? That's that's right. She's, she's like, are you sure you want to do that, John? That's usually- Rain right. him don't, in. Don't do it. But we're not, we're, glad that you're kind of you know uh, unleashed because uh your creativity you know gets uh shared you know through your writings you, you know you are you are an award-winning writer uh you've written for gastronomica one of the great culinary journals you've done everything yeah, uh and so you know all i can say is 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 i appreciate it i always look forward to seeing you at the expos and the and the yeah. new jersey uh what is it pizza and pasta northeast yes uh and yeah. uh, hopefully i'll get that back to Ohio sometime. Uh, I, I'd love to get, get you back on another time. I, cool. One thing that maybe we can just touch like on today and, and carry it the next time. Oh, yeah. Yes, that, but also I, one of the things I noticed about Ohio uh, as a state is that it's really a hotbed for creativity in the pizza sector. There's a lot of competitors that have come out of Ohio. Uh, maybe the, the first winners that the American teams have had were all seem to be from Ohio pizza, you know, pizzerias. And I'm just wondering if any thoughts about what it is about Ohio that has sort of be, allowed it to be this, uh, 
incubator for creativity in the pizza sector. People are, are really, they love pizza here in Ohio. They just love pizza. You know, I remember back, uh, way back when, uh, where they had judges at the, uh, in Columbus and they were showing them the Boboli crust as, as, a, as a marker, as a measurement for the perfect crust. And I just, it blew my mind, you know. And uh, back then yeah, I used yeah. to compete and they're like, well, that prosciutto you had on there, it was put on cold after the oven. You didn't cook it. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> but uh, but it's gotten a lot better, and the c competitors have gotten so so good. And, well, you guys uh, had one of the early competition shows in Ohio too, right? With the ice cream, the ice cream and pizza show. Yes. Uh huh. So and, and Benapix and stuff. But uh, yeah, now I'm I'm yeah. just open to anything, and you know that's what I love about emceeing at at the. Uh, 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 the pizza expo. It is such a great competition now. And I, I learned so much. And those, it's those little things. These judges like uh, Domenico Crolla, he, he knows so much stuff that yeah. you, you can't get anything over on him. Especially and yeah, and his, uh, and his you know, website, his, his uh, Instagrams and websites are kind of oh, like, again, mind blowing. Mind stuff. blowing. Yeah. So, yeah. And well, it's just it's even having like. Possible. The vaca rosa, uh, like parmesan. You don't just say parmesan. No, I've got the vaca rosa, which is the red cow, the old type of parmesan from the red cow. This is you know, that kind of stuff really rings, uh, gets you some good points. Well, we're running out of time, so we're going to definitely have to have you back to continue this conversation. <laughs> uh, but I did want to mention something. My producer Jeff tells me that the ascot is coming back. So that German judge wearing the ascot oh, gave Paisley. me grief. It was purple Paisley ascot too, man. I mean, if, if there's any ascot, mega ascot, that was a mega ascot. <laughs> well, those of you, if you see anyone wearing a purple Paisley ascot, you'll know that it's coming full circle from 20 years ago when, when, when the judge gave John grief in yes. the competition. But John, <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much for being a part of uh, Pizza Talk. Thanks for coming on, showing us some of your work. Uh, uh, people that want to follow John, you, you've got uh, your own blog. You're still doing, I, I know you haven't been doing blogging as much on the Pizza yeah. Goon, but are you doing Instagram yeah. or where are you? Instagram a lot, up, yeah. Showing, most of your stuff? Jay Gutekant, just J G T E K N S, or Facebook, you can try and friend me and uh, yeah. So that's, that's uh, all good. And hopefully I'll see you in Atlantic City in October at the, uh, a Northeast Pizza and Pasta Show, uh, God willing. Yes. And uh, again, John Kudikans, thank you so much for being part well, of Well, I'm honored. I'm today. really honored. Uh, visit Peter. the Avalanche. And my pleasure is in, and uh, my honor as well. So thank you. And uh, thank you all for joining us. We'll see you at the next episode of Pizza Talk. Thanks. Mm -hmm.